sit down and we're going to ask the questions here and then I'm going to answer those and if people are willing we may use some of those. Um, it's very interesting to try to see out what people want to know. You know, I've spent 25 years studying bone health and the question is, gee, I know a lot of things that are interesting to me, but what's interesting to you all? What will be helpful? What will make your life easier and more wonderful? And so that's what I want you to be thinking about your questions. And if, you're, if you said, I don't mind being on YouTube, I'll sit right up here and do it. And if you don't want to do it, um, that's fine. We can just ask the questions like this and we can, I can answer them standing up here. We find people in the big wide world, now about 100,000 people see that blog I put out every week. Have, all of you signed up for the blog, have you? Well, if you don't, Jean-Marie will get your... It's little weekly tips. We send an email. And 100,000 people get that. And when they're really impressed is when I talk with other people, when I talk with other clients or when I talk with other professionals. It's fun to see more than just me talking or hear more than me, just me talking. To get, and the questions you have are the same thing the questions all of, people all over the world have. So we're going to start. This talk um, was entitled... Uh, overcoming, uh, taking charge and overcoming osteoporosis and osteopenia. And the first point to overcoming and really taking charge in my mind is information, is becoming informed. So the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about the bone health basics, really just the, the key points on understanding the nature of osteoporosis, the causes, the true causes that we see them now in the best prevention and treatment. And those of you that followed my work have known I've, I've writ, I wrote a book on this which was called Better Bones, Better Body. Um, and then I wrote the uh, Acid Alkaline Food Guide. So there's a lot of information there and there's a lot of information on our website, betterbones.com. So if you get like lost in this, don't worry. Just whatever, whatever adheres to your mind, just use that little fact and then there's a lot on the website. And if anybody really wants these slides, we can we can um, email them or email them a link to them if a person says, I really want the slides. So the first hour is going to be this, and maybe it'll be a little less than the hour, this understanding and rethinking osteoporosis, and then we'll get into questions and answers, which will help empower each of you to your own path. Um, so let's just begin here. This... Um, this little remote here is a little different than I'm used to. We'll figure it out. Yeah, there we go. So I run two groups we have, the Center for Better Bones, where we see individuals and do writing, and the Better Bones Foundation, where we do research. The foundation really looks to, to rethink the nature, causes, and best prevention and treatment of osteoporosis. Oh, here we go. So this is what we've been thinking about for a long time. Better Bones, Better Body was the first book. I'm sure Wendy has it here. I write articles for magazines. This was fun. This was Vogue magazine recently asked me to write an article. This is terrific. An article on bone health. And what, what do they show on the cover? Uh, this black swan woman who's actually a great candidate for osteoporosis because one of the big problems is as we lose weight, we lose bone. And very thin people have an additional problem with bone health. I, in fact, we, were, we really wanted to write the editor and say, did you have to put my article on how to build bone health right with an anorexic woman right in the cover? Um, but And people often ask me, what, how did you get into this? I'm actually an anthropologist and a nutritionist. And I got into this because my grandmother, um, at 101, fractured a hip. She was in a bathtub. She was living alone at 101. And, you know, you, I always say, what were we doing letting her live alone at 101? And that was, you know, in a different day and age. And in a bathtub. Now, you know, so, and she broke a hip and she went to bed. And she said, she, they said, well, do you want to go to the doctor? She said, you know, I've been to the doctors before. I don't, uh, she said, I've taken care of my sons for 100 years. They can take care of my, my boys. I've taken care of my boys for 100 years. They can take care of me. And that's what happened. She just laid in bed. She was very sound of mind. She'd watch Ronald Reagan and say, oh, he was so wonderful in the Sylvania ads. She was, <laughs> she was, she was so fascinated with just current events. And she just peacefully passed a year later to the date. I always wondered how long she would have lived if she didn't have two things. One was rickets. You remember rickets? Severe vitamin D deficiency. She had a stomach operation many, many years ago for an ulcer. She didn't, she didn't get proper sunlight or vitamin D. She had wicked rickets, and you could tell by the bowed legs. If we have time, I'll show you a video of her. It's really amazing how a person... You probably have some grandparents that got along that were very crippled. 
but got along very well. And she never complained once in her life about pain, about not being able to walk well. It, so much that we didn't, I didn't think there was too much wrong until my friend from South America came and said, are you kidding? She's got osteoporosis and rickets. It was the most outstanding thing, and I thought how long she might have lived. Um, a person of very sound mind and very strong heart. And it was, a, it was, it was instructive, and it's still instructive to look and see how she managed. But most of all, that attitude, it, it's incredible. Um, if I just get a little bit sick or tired, I'm complaining to everybody, you know, and it didn't work. What we're going to talk today, our Better Bones program is very similar to what the Surgeon General said you should do. So it's not anything, it's not anything extremely unusual. What we say is the, the Surgeon General in 2004 did a report on osteoporosis, and he said, here's how you should treat. He's telling the doctors of the country. First, nutrition lifestyle changes. Nutrition, physical activity, fall prevention. We're going to see fall prevention. He said, do this first. This is the base. Then look for secondary causes. At the Center for Better Bones, when we see people who aren't doing well, we always send them back to their doctor to get a workup for why. Your bones were meant to last a lifetime. We started a bone health revolution that you'll see on our website, and I think we'll get to show our website a bit. And one of the first parts of the manifesto is bones were meant to last a lifetime. And if they're not lasting a lifetime, is something's wrong. Either you're vitamin D deficient, you're losing calcium in the urine, you have a parathyroid problem, you're on medications that damage bone. So I'm going to show you what normal bone loss is, and if you have more than that, then we know that there's something going on. So we, he said the same thing. He said look for secondary causes, and then he said drug therapy. Now, right away, some of you might say, hey, this isn't what happened when I went to my doctor. When I went to my doctor, they right away said, oh, let's start right up here. Let's start with drug therapy, and then maybe one day, if people bug us enough, we'll test for vitamin D. But this is what the Surgeon General said. This is what they're saying in Canada. This is what wise guidelines are to start with the things to see how much you can recover health and then only move into drug therapy when you need to do it. And so this is, the, this is exactly the program we've developed um, just to start out, some basics about bone, kind of rethinking the nature of bone. It's pretty striking. Bone is twice as tough as granite for withstanding compression forces, four times more resilient than concrete in standing up to stretching, the ability to stretch. And actually when you stretch bone, when you bend bone, that's when the signal is sent to build bone, and five times lighter than steel. It's a very, very strong tissue, and actually we can do well with even a reduced amount of bone as long as the bone is strong and healthy. And this is what we always try to promote. Bone is complicated tissue. Just, just This is a little simple example of all the different types of bone tissue, all the blood that's flowing through it. It's, it's living tissue that constantly changes. Um, and one of the things we often think about, one of the components of bone on the more smaller level are these protein ropes upon which mineral crystals sit. These are calcium phosphorus crystals. So it's really like a it's really like a sponge made of protein upon which minerals sit. Okay? And one of the things I'm going to show you is an easy way to find out if you're losing bone right now is to test and see how much of this protein sponge shows up in the urine. Because when you lose bone, both minerals come off, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, mostly calcium, and this protein. So there's a simple test that they can detect in the urine how much bone protein you're lo losing. It's called the NTX bone resorption marker. We use it all the time. If you want to know, am I losing bone right now at this minute? I'll show you about that. Um, bone, what I'm most impressed with and, and is that bone is very intelligent tissue. These are, these are bone cells. And the interesting thing about this, each Right now in your body, there's a million spots, one million spots, where old pieces of bone are being broken down and new pieces of bone are being laid down. How does the body know where? If it says, how does the body know, let's build new tissue right here? It knows because it senses that that's weak, that that tissue is being old, it's worn out, it needs to be replaced. It's like a concrete foundation. Every once in a while, you get some damage. It knows because these bone cells are constantly communicating with one another. Uh, these bone cells, called osteocytes, they have tentacles, so they connect, every bone cell connects to every other bone cell in the body. 
So you have this network of information that's constantly going on telling where to rebuild new bone. And what we're going to see is how can you enliven this network of information? So it says, hey, let's, let's really go to the spots that need repair. Let's really rebuild bone, new bone effectively. How you rebuild bone is this process of certain cells come in, they're called osteoclasts, and they're the, they're the dig crew. They send, oh, so there's a, the body says, hey, there's a weak spot here, sends these cells to produce acid to break down bone. All the little calcium, phosphorus, proteins are recycled, and you get all the hole built in the bone. Then other cells, it, after you do this excavation, you take the collagen, you recycle, there, all these parts are put back into fluid. The body is the biggest recycling plant in all the universe. It's pretty amazing, very effective at recycling. Big. Then new cells, osteoblasts, are stimulated to put down new protein matrix, new collagen, and just like the same kind of tissue there is in our skin and our teeny parts of our, our body. The protein our teen matrix is laid down by these new cells that come and form that just foamy protein matrix, and then eventually that all calcifies and you get a repaired bone tissue. Now, the bone remodeling process, when we're too little, when we're little, we break down very little metal bone. We start out this big, and all of a sudden we get this big. Little, we're building bone. In other words, we're building fire exceeds bone breakdown. Right? When we get to be like 20, pretty much even bone breakdown, bone buildup. At 20, you can still build new bone. If you do exercise, get the vitamin D things, even later in life you can build new bone. But the tendency is uh, when you get beyond your 20s, the, that is kind of stable, then when you get... Uh, like in your 40s, there tends to be more for breakdown. And at menopause, that adjustment to that new hormonal thing, there tends to be more breakdown, less buildup. And so you tend to see a loss of bone. The average woman, for example, in this culture, loses about 10% of her bone mass in the, f the, five, the first five years before menopause and the first five years after. And most of that is lost the year before menopause. It's very, so you really, be, so that's the year before the last period, which you don't know when it is. Because if you're in the middle of it, you don't know, it's just going to be, it's going to be my last one. And it's actually a year before that last one. So it's when the body is adjusting to those hormones. So when you look at your bone density test, you keep in mind, oh, was this during the menopausal transition? Because you're going to expect to see bone loss. When people come in at 50, we really want to halt that bone loss, as to, to reduce it as much as you can. There's some mysteries of bone health, like one, one mystery is that thin women lose more during the menopausal transition, and it's not really clear why. So you want to work extra well, and you can measure the NTX I mentioned, this urine test to see, well, am I losing a lot, or is it pretty much normal? One of the things that's empowering is to know that there is normal bone loss. During menopause, there's that whole 10%, many people 20%. And then when you get to your 60s, you'll, the average loss is one half to one percent a year. So you see that in your bone density, you know that's average. We see lots of people that stabilize and even build bone. That's our quest, even to keep building bone. But it's very normal. And you know what? If you don't do anything between if you don't do anything between 35 and 85, the average woman will lose about 45 percent of her bone and 45 percent of her muscle, and so will men. Yeah, it's like a, it's like enough to make you want to go out and do a little exercise. It's good to it's good to keep it in perspective. But on the other hand, here's an interesting fact: What's the average age of hip fracture? 80. What's the average age of death? 80. So, so you know, most people, the average person is dead. You know, this whole hip fracture scare is really interesting because the average person is dead by the time of hip fracture. So, you, if you know, you want to be able to live long and not and and and, and still have. And a very interesting thing, if you get into your 90s, you don't tend to fracture hips anymore. It's really very interesting. There's these unusual, it's not that it keeps getting weaker and weaker. If you make it through that transition, it's a very interesting kind of thing. What we want to do is maintain strength. Our goal, my goal personally, and to help people is to maintain strength for as long in our life as we can. It's the nature of life to grow, to flourish, and then to decline. But we want to make that decline very short and sweet and, and stay as strong as we can, which is... Which is really, we, I, we'd like to fight against nature, but it's awfully tough. But we can certainly maintain strength much more if we adjust our lifestyle and our thoughts and our attitude. So here's what it looks like. This is, this is an osteoporotic bone. This is bone that they've taken off all the protein matrix. This is just the mineral. And you see it has a lot of holes in it. This is a more, bone is still pretty large empty space. And you know something? If you study Deepak Chopra, these people, your body is large empty space. There's as, much, there's as much distance between the atoms in your body as there is between the stars and the sky. 
proportionally, or we don't recognize it because we seem very solid to us. But bone is an example. It's not very solid. And, but it has an architecture that's quite strong. And you'd say, oh, this bone, a lot. Can I get over this rheumatoid arthritis? Can I do other natural things? I happen to work with a very... A famous physician, Dr. Russell, just means you have a lower density than the average young woman, and of course you're going to have lower muscle mass. We, you know, it, there's those changes that occur with aging, but you want to try to maintain as much as possible. One of the abuses has been that osteopenia has kind of been interpreted as a disease, and it's not, and it was never meant to be. It was just meant to distinguish people with a little bit less bone than average people. And the really interesting fact is that bone mineral density doesn't predict fracture. This is very interesting. Uh, you cannot tell who's going to fracture by bone mineral density. And in fact, in this very large study, when they finally looked and they said, well, who fractures and what bone density did they have? This was a U.S. study. They did 200,000 women. They found that the black and Hispanic women had the highest risk of fracture. This was at 1.0. I mean, say white and Hispanic women. White and Hispanic women had the highest risk of fracture. Native Americans had 80% the risk. Afro-Americans had one half the risk. And Asian Americans had a third of the risk. Now, what's strange about this? Have you ever heard the myth, oh, Asian Americans are, have a higher risk of osteoporosis? That's because they had lower bone density. These Asian Americans had the lowest bone density of them all, but they had the lowest fracture rate too. Now, there's two explanations for that. One, you could say, well, they're, they had stronger bones. But then you, that's an interesting explanation. For various lifestyle reasons, they had stronger bones. And they attribute this to everything, to sitting on the floor, to doing more exercise, to eating more fish. It has more vitamin D, lots of different things. But it also appears that it has to do with how they test bone density. And we'll talk about that in a minute. It's not just thin bone. More than half of those who experience a fracture do not have an osteoporotic bone density. In other words, you all know that the two minus 2.5 standard deviations, you've all heard that, right? Two point five, if your bone density is 2.5 standard deviations away from a young person, they say you have osteoporosis. Well, of all the fractures, more than half of them, in some studies, 70% of the fractures occur in people who have osteopenia or even normal bone density. And so this is one of the things that really made him question, well, geez, there's certainly much more two fractures than just bone density. And what they've come up with, of course, is the fact that they're multiple risk factors. Robert Heaney, one of the major calcium researchers, recently reported that low bone mass probably accounts for less than half of all fractures. And people would say now uh, the research is looking like even less than half significantly less than half. So you might say, well, what is it then? What are the other factors that are important if bone density isn't the be-all and end-all? Did you get a little copy of our camel here? Did you, did you look, anybody look at that camel and see this is just a few of the factors that are important? And you might identify with them. In the old days, for example, smoking was a really, smoking can be very damaging to bone. And it would be rare to find uh, somebody with severe osteoporosis that didn't smoke. Excessive alcohol. A little bit of alcohol is okay, excessive alcohol. Um, today we find certainly lack of vitamin D is a really big one. Certainly a lack of a whole series of minerals, an acid-forming diet, lots of different things we're going to talk about. The point here is that multiple risk factors, it's not just one thing, it's not just bone density, and there's many things that you can change. The major risk factors, if you said, okay, Susan, enough of that, tell me what the major ones are. The major ones are like previous fracture. A previous, if you fractured needlessly, if you had a low trauma fracture, that is a serious risk factor. Um, Jean, let's just put that chair there for now. Let's just put this big chair over there. Um, if, you're, if you are thin and very thin and underweight, 
as we age, we want to keep our weight up. And the people that lose weight as they go on in age can be a problem. History of severe dieting, steroid use, 20% of all osteoporosis, like I mentioned, little exercise, little muscle mass, irregular periods or early menopause. The Swedes just did an interesting study. If you had menopause before 40, 42, very highly risk associated to low bone density and fracture. Of course, that's quite early menopause. In this country, you'd probably use hormone therapy to try to compensate for that until you got to be at menopausal age. Family history of fracture in particular, not only thin bone and fracture, hip fracture, advanced age, falling is a whole new frontier. In fact, some European researchers recently said, hey, you know, these drugs, they really aren't that effective, they're expensive, they have a lot of side effects, why don't we pay attention to what's the real cause of fracture, which he sees as falls. And there's a lot of movement on fall prevention. And the simple practical thing is if you say, you know, my balance isn't as great as it was, then you pay really good attention. You think about, why don't I do, up at the university, they have a whole balance center now. Why don't I do Tai Chi? The Chinese do Tai Chi, they see very nice results. Why don't I do some yoga? Why don't I do Pilates? Or why don't I just go to my local chiropractor and ask for balance exercises? That is an extremely important thing, a simple thing to do. And there is a little tendency to lose balance as we go along. So working in any way you do, working with fall prevention, including you know having good lights, making sure there aren't carpets, tripping, just developing awareness about how we move. Things like the um, Alexander technique is neat. Whatever, so many different techniques you like that can help us be aware of our body and how we move. Fall prevention is a really big thing. If there's, on, if there's ongoing bone loss, I'm sorry about this, I'm not used to this thing here. If there's ongoing bone loss, um, you really want to pay attention to it. That's why, if, if over the years you keep losing more than that 1% or that one half percent then you want to pace, but you want to get someone to help you look for the secondary causes. Our campaign for the last year has been helping people find the cause of their bone loss, t telling their, giving them a list of tests, take these tests to your doctor, there's a standard osteoporosis workup. You know, there is a protocol by which you try to find out what the problem is. You know, if you have a problem, it's good to try to find out the cause before you start treating it, you know. So this is what our campaign is to try to help people. And I'll show you on our website, betterbones.com, we have a list of the standard osteoporosis workup. It's a document you can take right to your doctors, and I have right here a list of those tests. This is for people that say there is a problem, you know. And we always say, we always say if the doctor says, you know, you've got a problem, you've got a problem and you should take drugs, then it's always good to say, well, if it's serious enough to take drugs, it's probably serious enough to do a workup to find out why. Is there any causes for the problem? You understand what I mean? And there's some very simple tests that are proposed by the Canadian government, proposed by our government. Just one more thing about risk factors. So this was a really fascinating big study. <coughs> Looked at lots of people. <coughs> this is the number of risk factors. You just had one to, none or two, three or four, more than five. This is bone density. These are the people who had lowest bone density. These people had middle. These people had the highest. If you take the lowest bone density, the people with few, few wrist fractures, they did not fracture. The people with three or four fractured more, it was the people with five or more wrist fractures that tended to fracture. And the same thing with the people with moderate uh, risk factor assessment. You can go through and it talks about everything from, you know, having a previous fracture to eating too much protein or consuming too much alcohol to things like stress and worry, which actually damage bone. Fear is the emotion that's extremely damaging to bone. Um, and that's by an interesting, uh, by interesting traditional Chinese medicine. So the highest people with most bone density, the same thing. Very low fracture if you had low risk factors, but when you get into multiple risk factors. So we're coming to an age where we individualize. It's not just everyone with low bone density has got an issue. It's an issue of multiple risk factors. And if you, if you think about it, what, what's really good to do is to take, if you're having an issue, if, you, if you're just here because you say, hey, look, I, want to have, I know that my bones are my infrastructure. I want them to be strong my whole life, and I want to live a long life, and I don't want to have my foundation give out then all the things we're going to date are really very easy, very simple to do the Better Bones, Better Body program. If you say, on the other hand, it looks like i got a problem. 
I'm 60 and I'm losing more than one half to one percent a year, or I've had a fracture really and I shouldn't have probably fractured, then what you want to do is think about this individual assessment. You want to think about what's going on in my individual case. This is when you ask for a certain few tests, and you you yourself look at that camel and you say, what's going on? You know. Could it be that I'm drinking too much alcohol? Could it be that I just am not doing any kind of exercise? I'm going to show you the data on exercise is impressive. The data is very impressive on exercise. You assess the individual case. That's the first thing we do when anyone comes to our office is assess the individual case. Then we develop an individual Better Bones, Better Body program. What I'm going to do today is t give you the highlights of that program, the steps to that program, things you can do yourself. Um, then we maximize nutrient intake. And we do this with both supplements and diet. We do a special diet called the Alkaline for Life diet. Anybody hear of the Alkaline diet? Yeah, some of you must have, right? Gosh, I wrote a whole book on it. Come on, some of you have read it. <laughs> good, good, good. It's a complicated topic, but I'm gonna, I'll, we'll talk about it. Because just like you have acid rain and the lakes and the Adirondacks and the trees are getting damaged, we can create too much acidity in our body. And we create that because of an imbalanced diet. Too much food that when we burn it up leaves acid. Foods like coffee, sugar, alcohol, grains, excess protein, most of our refined foods, where other foods balance off those acids. Anybody know what those foods are? Fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, spices, all those things that your grandmother said were good for you anyway. They leave, they leave alkali reserves that can buffer acid. We'll talk about it as much as you want. In the book, The Acid Alkaline Food Guide, I tried to make it real concise, and we list all the foods if they acidify or alkalize. We're going to talk about that. Detoxification is always important, um, whether it's things like smoking and alcohol or whether it's things like stress or heavy metals. All these things are important. Digestion, you know, the more I work with bone health, the more I see it's related to digestion. That's not a strange, right? Because how do we get all our nutrients? that we need for building blocks. We have to assimilate the food. I'm a person with weak digestion, so I've come to understand that, and I've come to understand you know, ways, simple things we can do to build digestion. Like you'd be surprised. Most people say, oh, I love raw food. Raw food's good for you. Raw food is extremely hard to digest. So if you have weak digestion, you want to have hot and cooked food. You don't want to have raw food. You don't want to have cold food because your body has to spend a lot of energy cooking that food in the stomach, so to speak. Um, if you have reflux, you'll be surprised how much better you feel if you set aside those salads and have steamed vegetables. Hi. We'll talk about that better. We have a whole paper on 10 steps to stronger digestion on the website. If you don't have, have good digestion, pay it, work on it. It's because you don't, if you have bad digestion, you aren't going to absorb the nutrients and what else? Then you end up taking drugs, like acid-suppressing drugs, right? Then Prilosec and those things. Those things actually now are associated with higher fracture risk. Be make some sense. You know, use them for 25 years, then. So we want to try to be find the cause of as many problems as we can. Sometimes we can't, but sometimes. So then we're going to work on digestion. I'm going to show you the data on exercise. It'll be half time. We'll run around the block. <laughs> it definitely inspire you. Health um, and you know what you, you know when you're young the ovaries, and it's really true. If you have a person who is not menstruating, who's menstruating, that is extremely, or who is irregular, that's extremely important. It usually indicates, in many cases, a deficiency of progesterone. Some of the major reasons in prior from Vancouver, 25% of the young women in Canada and U.S. are progesterone deficient because they, their ovulation is not proper. They look like they have periods, but they don't. And this lead woman, substandard bone building. And for the woman who says, I just couldn't get pregnant. I, kept, I got pregnant, but I had all these miscarriages. And finally, they gave me progesterone suppositories. Anybody know a case like that? It's a very common situation, and that is a sign of progesterone deficiency. And it's likely that person has been progesterone deficient in their reproductive years Early years is when you want to, when you can build bone mass terrifically, but it is dependent on proper menstrual cycle. So that's a very good thing to pay attention to. And things like Chinese medicine actually have a way to heal, you know, not just to say take hormones, but even if it's taking hormones, you want to correct those early menstrual problems. But when we get older, the endocrine issue I'm really fascinated with is the adrenals. Mm -hmm. 
the adrenal glands which are attached to the kidneys. In Chinese medicine, they're one gland, the adrenals and the kidneys. They control bone health. They control which minerals are going to stay in the body and which minerals leave the body. The kidneys and the adrenals are extremely important to bone health and stress. Adrenals are what really responds to stress. You remember the adrenal hormones? Cortisol, the stress hormone. When you're driving in the car and somebody runs in front of you and you have this big jolt, that is this are these adrenaline, cortisol, these adrenal hormones. Like your get up and go hormone, but if they stay get up and going too much, they wear down the body. So one of the tests we always say, get a test for cortisol. Let's see if your cortisol is always high, you're going to be damaging bone. And the person often knows it because they feel stressed, they feel worried, they feel... They, I asked Geraldine Pryor once, how do you know if people have high cortisol. She said, it's easy. <laughs> Two things. Ask them if they're happy and ask them if they have cold hands and cold feet. I said, wow, that's so interesting. We, we, you know, and so many of us don't even presume that happiness is a quality we'd even look for. So we want to cultivate happiness. And if we say, I'm really kind of stuck in the stress syndrome, you can easily measure cortisol. And you can control it with meditation. You can certainly can have different supplements which help to lower cortisol. A lot of them actually now because we're realizing that cortisol is a major mediator of bone loss. And cortisol actually corresponds to DHEA. DHEA is the adrenal hormone that's kind of the youth adrenal hormone. Actually, you can probably buy it on the shelves right here, but we don't recommend people dose themselves with that hormone, but you might get tested for it. If you say, I'm really stressed, and you test for cortisol, which is the bad guy, and DHEA, which is the good guy, adrenal hormone. And a lot of times doctors will supplement. with. If DHEA is low, you should supplement. If it's not low, you don't supplement. But that can help with bone because DHEA after menopause, is, helps to produce all these other hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. So there are people who specialize in hormone therapy, and it's especially stress-related hormone therapy, I think, is very interesting. Cortisol and the adrenals. And how do we take care of the adrenals? We meditate. We do gentle exercises. We try to work with the tendency to worry. Um, and there's so many resources now. Just the other day, I was going through a worry episode. So I started looking, listening to Pema Shutra, Chondra, Pama Chondra, who's a Buddhist. It's very nice stuff. Eckhart Tolle. You can go on YouTube. You can hear all these people giving these. And you, just, you scan them and you say, hey, this sounds good to me. I feel better when I listen to this. Feeling better is a sign you're in the right direction. My favorite is Deepak Chopra. Deepak Chopra has got a campaign now to help 100 million people transform their awareness to bring about world peace. It's the most very fascinating thing. And he has a YouTube channel called Chopra Well which you can go and see. It's got little, all kinds of little lectures, little vignettes. It's terrifically uplifting. So you might say, well, Susan, you don't like that, but I like Christian radio. Whatever, whatever it is that you feel good, that is healing. So you, and now with, the, with this Internet, we can, we can expose ourselves to all kinds of people, whether it's Dwayne, Dwyer, whoever you like that makes you, gets you back to that true nature, that true quiet within you, that true, that true power within you, and away from this constant worry, which really can easily happen because we're so overburdened with information and there's, it's such a hectic life going on and um, we're constantly reminded of so many things we should be worrying about. <laughs> so then, of course, there's drug, th there's, there's drug therapy. And drug therapy, just like the Surgeon General said, it's fine. It's fine. There's a place for it. But the trick with drug therapy these days that they're starting to realize is that bone drug therapy can only should only be really used if you need it, if you're at high. And what does that mean? If you're at high fracture risk. Why? Because one, there's too many side effects, and the doctors themselves are getting a little scared about this because there's too many cases of liability saying, you know, yeah, I pulled out a tooth and it rotted. I needlessly turned and I fractured a leg. These things do tend. They can happen. They're rare, but they can happen. And the other thing is that it's costly for people in Canada. The Canadian government, a socialized government, they put out. They have a group called Osteoporosis Canada. It studies, some of my friends are on that board, it studies what you should do for bone health and tells the doctors how to treat. They have really interesting guidelines. I give them to all my clients. They say, don't treat by bone density alone. Treat by multiple risk factors. They say, do all these tests. Find out what the cause of it is and only use drugs if you really need them. Why? Number one, they don't want to waste their money. Socialized medicine and drugs they don't really need. And number two, they know you can't use them forever. So you save them for when you really need them. And even in this country, if you go to the big meetings, they're, they're saying, yeah, we made a mistake giving young women all these drugs because you can't, now they find if you use them more than five years, you might get some problems, blah, blah, blah. So 
you know, there's a second thinking on that. And, of course, there's constant, constant new generation of drugs. So you have to be, you have to kind of get centered in yourself and assess when might I want to pull the trigger on bone drugs. And there's, there is data. You can sort through the data and see which things. The Europeans have some nice therapy. They have a vitamin K therapy in Japan, which I like. They have strontium in France, which are much, I think, safer than our drug therapies. But if you get to the drug therapy part, then you study it and you say, okay. You work with your doc and you say, what am I going to do here? Um, <clears throat> and then you always want to, no matter what you do, you want to test for success. What people don't know is 15% of the time the drugs don't work. That is, they don't halt bone breakdown. And certainly our natural programs don't work for everyone. So we always test. You test by bone density, and how else do you test? Remember, the NTX, that little urine marker of bone breakdown. That test was developed to see if the drugs are working. They look at your urine and they say, is there too much bone protein here? If there is, you know that drug's not working. So you don't have to just take stuff and know if it's not working. You can actually test and find out if it's working. Okay, so we always want to test for success. This is the Better Bones, Better Body program. And let's just take a couple minutes and go through it. So step one, assess the individual case. You want to look at the overall bone status. You want to look at real fracture risk. And this is, the, this is the thing you want to be thinking about. What's my real fracture risk and the underlying causes of bone weakness? If you say, hey, I got a real risk. I, I, broke, I, was, I was on the ice. I fell and I broke my wrist. Well, you could always say, well, it was an unusual fall. And it's true. There are falls at certain angles that are always going to break. Or you could say, you know, I really shouldn't have probably fractured. Then you say, well, let me see. What's the cause for the bone weakening? And you start looking at all the possible factors. These are the common secondary causes. What this means is things that can cause bone weakening. And this is what we suggest you have tested for. Vitamin D deficiency, the biggest one. Um, everyone had their vitamin D tested? Anyone didn't have their vitamin D tested? Good, good. Well, maybe we'll have one of you. Maybe we'll have somebody sit in the hot seat and tell me why they didn't. Uh, it's, you know, we have just written an article for a few years ago for a medical journal really proposing and having good research to my mind that half of all fractures could be prevented with adequate vitamin D levels. And we're going to show you what that adequate level is. It's not a guess anymore. We know exactly what you need. And it is really kind of imperative now that the patient demand it. Many doctors are starting to do it, but you just have to go say, look, I want my vitamin D tested. It's really simple. It's been highly linked to a reduction in cancer, diabetes, heart disease, many things outside of bone health. And people just aren't getting the sunlight. We're totally dependent on vitamin D for sunlight. We can do a vitamin D talk sometime. It's, it's very fascinating. It's the single simplest thing you can do to improve your health and that of your family is to get vitamin D tested and to get adequate vitamin D. Um, in fact, they look at hip fracture people around the world. 95% of these people are vitamin D inadequate. It's hard. To, in fact, I put out a challenge. If find me one case of hip fracture where somebody's not vitamin D inadequate. So it's a, very, it's a very powerful thing for bone health. And such a simple thing to do. And won't it be fun when we can actually test all nutrients? When we'll be able to say, hey, do you have enough manganese? You know, when we really know the function of manganese and we have a way to test. We test for vitamin D by blood level, but we also know the function. If your parathyroid's hormone's high, it's because you're low in vitamin D. There's functional tests. And, and I'm just writing a blog on that, actually, what, what research I'd like to see. And one is figuring out, if we can send somebody to the moon, why the heck can't we tell if you have enough manganese or zinc or copper in your body, or if the soils are depleted or not, the kind of things that... So, this urine loss of calcium. The doctors can do a 24-hour collection of urine and look at calcium. A number of people, 18% of people with osteoporosis, their, their kidney is leaking calcium. Anybody have that test, 24-hour? Anybody, if you had kidney stones, <coughs> they do it for bone health or kidney stones? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a very good doctor. You start to say why, because you, as, remember I said the body was a great recycling plant? Well, actually, the kidney filters blood all day long, right, to purify it. It filters so much blood all the time. Now, this is kind of amazing that 10,000 milligrams of calcium go through that kidney a day. It's hard to believe it. We take a 500 milligram, it's constantly recycling. The good stuff it's putting in the blood, the bad stuff it's putting in the urine. But what happens, it's not that the kidney's bad stuff, but the kidney, it's not that the calcium is bad stuff, but the kidney leaks some. It leaks. So the average person will have maybe 200 milligrams of calcium in the urine. But if you have more than 250 or 300, the kidney is losing it faster than you can absorb it. 
about 18% of the people with osteoporosis have this issue. So that is a, that's one of the standard tests we ask for. And there's ways to correct it, lowering the acidity in the diet. An alkaline diet can help higher uh, taking potassium citrate can help. And of course, there's certain drugs they use. Parathyroid hormone, another hormone that can really cause bone loss if it gets overactive. It can happen because of vitamin D deficiency, or it can happen just because there's a strange tumor that grows. It's not, it's not malignant, but it causes it to be overactive. Um, anybody heard of parathyroid issues? Any other? Well, good. Forget it. Don't pay attention. <coughs> Homocysteine. Homocysteine, this is another simple test to see if you have enough B12 and folic acid. This is a functional test to see if your diet is is, is adequate. It's for B12 and folic acid, both of which are really important to bone health. Cortisol, DHEA, I mentioned them, right? These are, if you're high cortisol, you're losing bone. And if you're stressed a lot, you could very well be high cortisol. Take Tai Chi, meditate, forget everything else, go to Bahamas for vitamin D and there you <laughs> Ovarian hormone test. If you're premenopausal and you, and you suspect that your hormones are off, it's very good to check them. Or you don't menstruate or the kids aren't menstruating properly. Really look into it. That's important. Chronic low-grade metabolic acidosis. The long-term loss of bone. Over the long haul, we lose bone and we lose muscle because we're too acid. And the body cannot be acid because all our enzymes and cells depend on a particular pH. You die if you're too acid. So what the body does in exchange, it just takes its reserves. And the reserves are mainly in bone and in muscle, to put it simply. So if you tone up your diet, then you can preserve bone and muscle better. And you can know if you tone up your diet by measuring. We have developed, in conjunction with Dr. Russell Jaffe, a little pH test, first morning urine test. We actually have a little pH kit I'll show you. And Wendy's got paper. We've got little instructions to, to actually see what your, if, you know, kind of, is my diet putting my bone in a good, my body in a good position to take care of itself. Okie doke. And then finally, the bone resorption markers, the NTX. We always say, people may come in, they may have a bone density three years ago, they have bone density today. They say, geez, over these three years, I lost 7%. I say, well, that's too much bone loss. Then our question is, okay, has that bone loss halted or is it still going on? Right? Now, the doctor might say, well, come back in two years. We'll know. We say get the NTX, and you can tell now. You can get a pretty good idea if you're breaking down too much bone right now and not have to wait for another bone density. These are popular tests. The bone doctors will know about them. The other doctors might not know about them. You can order them on the Internet for 60 bucks every place but New York. So you have to, New York, you have to get your doctor to order them. Oh, I heard there's some guy in California that's doing out of his, his home. This is not such a complicated little test that my friend says, I could send you some kits. I, well, I don't think it's a good idea because, you don't, you know, one of the labs we worked with, big lab, we were doing research with these markers. We sent split samples. They were so bad that that lab ended up paying $100,000 for that study because it was, because it was the, so you don't want somebody doing their basement because it may not be. It's a, you, know, you want a really high-quality lab, and you want to collect it according to my instructions, which are on the website. It's a second morning urine, but we do two days in a row. So if you get interested in that, look up betterbones.com, look up the NTX test. You can search our website, and it has that information. Okie dokie. So the step number two individualized program. First thing we do, get the nutrients. I think Jean gave you the 20 keep the bone building nutrients. Is you that hand out there, do you? When we talk about nutrients, you know, there's 20. We do the 20 keep. Is that this chart right here? Exactly. This thing right here. This is a little guy that I developed. Every nutrient is important to bone health, really, but there's 20 nutrients that are really, you know, highly documented. Everything from zinc, nutrient, manganese, copper, and chromium. Vitamin K. Everybody got that? And I could list the average intake. And you might look and see that the average intake is low for most of these nutrients. And I list the RDA, which is RDA, remember, is enough to prevent deficiency disease so you don't get scurvy. And it's nothing about building his health. And then the therapeutic range. So we'll try to have a person who has a bone health concern try to get the therapeutic range. We And we can, when you know, right now, calcium, we're talking about between diet and supplements. One of the things we're going to talk about is this whole news on calcium. That more isn't necessarily better, and calcium doesn't necessarily thank you, prevent from fracture. It's only if you're extremely low in calcium, like maybe 400 or 500 milligrams. People with 6, 7, 800 milligrams seem to know better off than people with 1,500. And you've probably seen the latest research. Finally, looking at doctors, keeps telling people, oh, take 1,500, take 2,000 milligrams of calcium. 
what happens a certain percentage of these women will develop hardening of the arteries will develop uh, and heart attacks because of calcification of the and the arteries will and what happens when you calcium by its own health you tend to saturate the system and if you do not have the nutrients go with the calcium and those nutrients largely are magnesium and vitamin K vitamin K is fascinating because vitamin there are types of vitamin K K2 is provides the one factor that prevents arterial endocalcification. We use K2 in every program. This was discovered from the Japanese work. Um, we'll talk a, a little second about vitamin K. So the calcium story, though, however, is what are they saying now? 1,200 milligrams with diet and supplements. For it, we rarely, the supplement I make that's sold on the internet now has 800. We're going to, and that's presuming a person gets five or six from their diet. We're going to lower it a little because most people get more in their diet. On the other hand, I'm a type of person, whatever, due to my speediness or whatever, I, sometimes I need a little bit more because I'll get leg cramps at night. See, so if you take the 1,200 and you say, you take 1,200 with diet and supplements, the average non-dairy diet has about 500, right? If you say, well, I'm eating a dairy or two a day, so you just maybe need five or 600 milligrams in supplements. But if you get leg cramps or things like that, then you try taking some calcium magnesium. Always take calcium with magnesium as much magnesium as calcium if you can, or at least half as much. And vitamin K is extremely important. Vitamin K2. K2 is a vitamin that's produced by bacteria. So it's this from fermented soy. You've heard of this thing, natto, this Limburger cheese of Japan. It's a fermented soy product. This is how they discovered. People who ate that stuff, they had little osteoporosis, and they had little heart disease. They said, wow, wait a minute, what's going on here? And now they've researched it, they've extracted it. That, that bacteria produces a very potent kind of vitamin K. Vitamin, recent studies have shown that K2, 180 micrograms. K2 as MK7, built bone strength, reduced heart, um, improved heart health, and increased bone density, but it took three years. So with these natural therapies, you have to pay attention. You need, you know, a series of, you know, uh, you need time. Yeah. Yeah. What we're going to do in the question and answer, Wendy's going to bring in some of her stuff, and we'll actually go right over it. Well, yes, and I got to tell you, not many people eat natto because natto tastes horrible and my secretary won't let me bring it into the office because it <laughs> smells so strongly it's like a Limburger cheese so no one really the Japanese eat it but they don't like it, they don't like it yeah <laughs> it's very you know and it's it's a fermented soy it's a rotten soybean it's very slimy and traditionally what they did is they take a chapstick 300 times 300 times to stir it because that gets the enzyme active now they say you can do it just 30 times it's funny you look at these traditional systems are really very precise so so, but that thing is very hard to eat. Yeah, so, but apropos that, if you have, if the one group of people that shouldn't use vitamin K is people on Coumadin. Because Coumadin is a drug that thins blood, and it actually is an anti-vitamin K substance. So if you take a lot of vitamin K, your Coumadin is less effective. So vitamin K, you always are careful with that. You don't, you don't use vitamin K with Coumadin, except with a very knowledgeable doctor. There's, they know how to handle that, but... Um, that's an important thing. So we want to get all these 20 key nutrients, some nutrients we don't think of. We don't think of vitamin K, very big bone builder. K1 is from the green leafy vegetables, and we're loving the vegetables because they alkalize, and we love them because of the vitamin K. But K1 is not as potent as K2, and K2 is produced by bacteria. Um, cheese, aged cheese has K2. People who eat aged cheese have better bone health, and they look at European studies. True cheese, not American cheese that God knows how they make that. But cheese <laughs> <laughs> reminds you of the green slime and the burgers, right? I mean, well, true fermented cheese. In other words, cheese is one or two, three, four years old that they actually ferment. The bacteria actually work on that cheese. It'll say how many years old it is. Aged cheese, true aged cheese. We have some cheeses that are like one or two years that you can actually get some nice... I mean, that, if any people remember the old timers, I mean, there's a delight in a real sharp cheese, and that's a very... My dad... They used to have a store, and the, he said they would have these wheels of cheese up in the attic. They'd be all covered with mold and everything like that. They'd leave them there several years, and then they'd get that stuff out, and that was a very delicious cheese, a very creamy, sharp cheese. You remember that, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a really superior cheese, and they still do it in Europe. Um, we just got into all this fast stuff here. Aged cheese will have it. Sauerkraut has it some. 
Fermented foods are good for you in so many ways. And now you see, Wendy's, a lot of ferments you'll, they'll be offering. You know, whether it's kefa, all, all these things are helpful. So we want to get the 20 key nutrients. We know vitamin K is rare. We know calcium we keep like the 20, uh, 1,200 milligrams. We know that things like manganese, manganese is interesting, right? Manganese, zinc, copper. These are trace minerals. There's a little bit in bone, but there's a lot more than we expect in the protein matrix. That protein, we always pay attention to the minerals, but we're forgetting that bone is by volume half protein. That collagen, that protein, and that needs zinc, manganese, and copper. In fact, there was a basketball player several years ago called Bill Walton in California, and he fractured, he fractured a lot. And so they found, they got concerned because he fractured because this guy was making a lot of money, you know. And he happened to be on a macrobiotic diet. And what they did, a, a guy called Saltman, a researcher at the University of California, did a lot of studies on him and found out he was deficient in zinc, manganese, and copper. And out of that grew the whole awareness that zinc, manganese, and copper are important to bone. This is about 20 years ago. Before that, everyone thought, hey, you don't need anything for bone. Somehow we thought bone is just magic. It just gives the calcium, it'll grow. I always laugh because... A million old ladies could fracture. Nobody bothers to find out why. One basketball player fractures, and there's all kinds of studies to try to find out why did he fracture. And that's exactly, so now we know manganese, zinc, copper. So all those nutrients, we can't judge your individual level, but we can say, get the therapeutic level. It's not going to hurt if you get them in water-soluble form. You get them in a citrate, which is very good because it also alkalizes. Then you have that as like an insurance program. A, a colleague of mine did a study in Europe the one thing he found common with all people with, uh, with fractures was manganese, low levels of manganese. So it's one of those nutrients we don't think of. Just go by our guidelines, try to, try to get something, you know, at least the RDA may be a little bit better towards our therapeutic. Um, the next step is, that, so, we, so we're talking about getting these, the supplements, and, and uh, I've gotten into another mode here. How did I do this here? Um... Oh, there we go. The 20 key nutrients are here. As I said, look at the, um, look at the therapeutic range. Try to see that you can get those. Um, we'll, have a, we'll have a discussion about that later. Vitamin D, I often like to say, what's more important than calcium? Anybody think vitamin D is more important than calcium? Yeah. And you know why it's more important? Because you can't absorb calcium without vitamin D. Like Robert Heaney, the major calcium researcher, says you can swim in calcium. And you cannot use it if you don't have adequate vitamin D. You cannot absorb it. And so you need at least a 32 NG of calcium, in order to, of vitamin D, in order to be able to absorb calcium. 32 NG. We know a 50 is better. They just did it. They finally did a study of indigenous people living in the tropics. The, some of these uh, people in Tanzania and that, these native peoples who lived outside, they have a blood level of vitamin D, just about 50 NG which is what we've been saying is the ideal level, and it looks like that's the natural level if people were living in the sunlight, how we evolved. We know that below 32, you cannot absorb calcium adequately, and you will not be able to maintain excellent bone health. I think vitamin K is going to be shown. In fact, some, some European studies show that vitamin K, markers of vitamin K adequacy, you see, your bone protein doesn't get formed right if you don't have vitamin K. And those markers were more effective than calcium markers in predicting fractures. So vitamin K, again, speaks to the fruits and vegetables, um, the really important of all the green leafy things. Potassium, again, really high in all the fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. Potassium is extremely important to bone. You know, it's interesting. Potassium, the RDA for potassium is five times that of calcium. We don't even think of potassium. But potassium, we need much more than any other nutrient. And we get it from fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. And you know how many servings of fruits, vegetables, and nuts, and seeds you need to get to have the recommended 4,700 milligrams of potassium? 13. 13. So you've got to think, well, if you start, if you know, if you, if you, if you, you know keep track of things, you, it's hard. It's hard. So you, because we're so used to having, well, we grab a sandwich here, there goes a whole bunch of calories with nothing, with no potassium, whereas if you have a bunch of steamed vegetables, you have some nuts, you have some avocado. The, there's a list of potassium foods on my chart. Potassium is very important to bone. Why? Because the body needs a lot of potassium to maintain electrolyte balance, but attached to potassium is what? The alkalizing compounds. Potassium in fruits and vegetables is potassium citrate. That potassium citrate the body turns into bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is the ultimate alkalizing thing. 
So from a bone point of view, we love potassium because it carries with it. No mineral stands alone. You don't just have calcium that stands alone. Calcium is attached to something. It's a positive charge. It's attached to a negative ion. So calcium is attached like to carbonate. You know, you probably have a calcium carbonate supplement or a calcium citrate supplement. It's this part, the carbonate or the citrate that alkalizes, that can remove acid from the body. So fruits and vegetables, high in potassium, are linked right to this alkalizing compound that prevents kidney stones, preserves muscle, allows for more proper enzyme functioning, so we like a diet. So the simple thing is 13 servings of fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds a day. Like, like if you lived out on the land, you know, like if we didn't have all this processed food. And you start looking at potassium content, things like this coconut water. What a great idea. All around the world, coconuts are wasted. Now somebody had the great idea. Let's take that water and sell it to these rich Americans. <laughs> and it's working fine. A cup of that stuff has like 500 milligrams of potassium. And it's got to be, it's going to be potassium citrate. It's going to be very good for you. So you can do your little pH test and you can see how it changes. It's the oil, coconut oil. Coconut oil is very good. It, it, it won't have such, I don't know the potassium. See, it won't, won't have much potassium in it, because, but it's a very nice oil medium chain triglyceride, very good for you. So potassium, we're very fond of potassium. Several studies using potassium citrate halting bone loss and halting the loss of calcium in the urine because of the alkalizing effect. Magnesium, magnesium is again a thing that's been way overlooked. There's no industry, like there was a big industry, the dairy industry way supported calcium. You know, we've had millions and millions of science studies of calcium. But unfortunately, there's no, there's no fruit and vegetable industry just yet that's stoked up to fund this research. Magnesium is also found in the fruits and vegetables, extremely important to bone, always taken together with calcium, or else you run the risk of calcium precipitating out, increasing kidney stones, increasing hardening of the arteries. Anybody you know Sherry Rogers? Remember Sherry from here? Sherry for years has been saying, look, you're nuts taking all this high calcium because you're going to end up with more heart attacks, and sure, that's exactly what happened. But we know, and Sherry knows, that if you have vitamin K and magnesium, if you balance that intake out, it's much better. And now even the government authorities have said you don't really need more than 1,200 milligrams, the average person. So we're toning way down from 1,500 milligrams in calcium supplements to like 1,200 with diet and supplements with perhaps six or seven, 800 magnesium, as much as you can take. Some people get a loose stool and have to, be, have to work around that because they have a block to magnesium uptake and you need to correct that and with adequate vitamin K. So these are more important than calcium. Um, ooh, vitamin D rules. Hard to read that. Vitamin D, essential for calcium absorption, reduces fracture. Even the conservative studies giving people any dose of vitamin D, I love this. They look at these studies. They're taking 400 units. 400 units won't do anything. And they say, hey, but it still reduces fracture by 20%. 20% is the good as a lot of these drugs are. Many of the studies show a 50% fracture reduction. Vitamin D is simply the simplest thing to do. Strengthens muscles. In these studies, what do they find? They find people fracture less than a month of taking vitamin D. So they're scratched in these nursing homes. How can it be? You know, why? Because people don't fall as much. It affects vitamin D, also affects the muscles. Why does vitamin D affect so many things? Because it's really not a vitamin. Vitamin D is a hormone, right? Vitamin D is a substance we call a vitamin. We produce it in the body from sunlight. We call it a vitamin because we can eat it in food like a few foods like fish. The body takes that substance, which it produces from sunlight exposure, only certain sunlight. Like we're get, coming to a time right now when you can't even produce it because we don't have the slant, the right slant of the sun. It's time to head to Florida, right? You know, or better yet, someplace where there's less traffic. But <laughs> so, what you do is you take that vitamin, you take this uh, that vitamin D factor, you produce it. The cholesterol factor turns it into a hormone. That hormone is what is every tissue in the body practically is affected by that hormone. That hormone serves as a turn-off switch to cancer. If you have enough vitamin D, that hormone allows for calcium absorption. So what does the body do being infinitely smart? It says, well, I only got so much vitamin D, how am I going to use it? It's going to use it for survival first. So it's going to use it to absorb calcium because you will die in a flash if your blood calcium isn't right. Blood calcium regulates nerve functioning, heartbeat, so the body is always going to keep that stable. That's why having your calcium tested, I mean, it's important for some persons, but it, but it doesn't, the it body's going to keep that straight or you're going to die, a very narrow range. So this says, well, let's use this vitamin D for to, keep the, to, to absorb calcium, keep that blood calcium stable because I want the system to live. Then it says, if you got a little extra, what does it do? It turns strengthens muscles. If you got a little extra, what does it do? It serves a turn-off switch to cancer. But if you got a little extra, what does it do? It helps to reduce inflammation 
if you got a little bit extra, it helps to improve autoimmune disease. And if you have a little extra, it actually you produce internally an antibiotic, a natural antibiotic. And people who take vitamin D, they've just done studies with kids, you reduce influenza by a half giving vitamin D because you have this natural antibiotic on board. So it's the wisdom of the body is if you don't have enough, it'll use it for what it has to. But if you have enough, they found studies, some of the studies show a re reduction in breast cancer, 20, 30, 40, 50%. And even if you're, di and you're diagnosed with breast cancer, your level of vitamin D at the time of diagnosis is important to your recovery. It's a very fascinating. You can look at a, a website called grassrootshealth.org. Or is it .net? Grassroots Health. You'll see it. Uh, Carol Beggarly. She, I had her come to town to lecture. Anybody come a few years ago? Wendy sponsored it. Anyone go to that lecture? Yes. She had breast cancer, and her son started searching this. She said, hey, you know, Mom? She said, this, is, this, this breast cancer stuff is really related to low vitamin D. She started going to the national meetings. She was a business person. She got out there. She'd be at these meetings, and she'd say, hey, why don't you guys tell? They'd give the reports. See, we find a lower incidence of breast cancer, and people have higher vitamin D. We find that if you're treated. So why don't you tell people? They said, well, you know, we can't because we don't have these double-blind studies. But a few researchers came up to her and said, you know, we have sympathy with you. She said, we'll join with you. And now they have a gigantic network of researchers who are doing videos. They have worldwide campaigns about vitamin D. It's grassrootshealth. Is it .org or .net? And she has a wonderful chart that shows every all kinds of diseases, how they're reduced by the level, how much of MS you have if you have a 20 level of vitamin D as compared to a 50 level of vitamin D. It's really very impressive and it's enough to, it's enough to encourage us that one single woman who said, hey, there's something going on and these scientists aren't sharing it, has brought about a gigantic, a gigantic change. B A G G E R L Y, Carol Beggarly. It's that net? Perfect. Thank you. And there's all kinds of, the University of California has taken this on. They have all kinds of videos. They have big conferences. They, have a, even, a, they even have a campaign in Japan to increase the vitamin D levels in Japan. It's a wonderful, empowering thing. Strengthen muscles, reduces falls within several weeks, reduces many of the other degenerative diseases. It's a vitamin D striking story. Vitamin K, it's interesting, vitamin K is a really, really powerful agent. The researchers started doing, they looked at vitamin K, this was really funny, they did 440 women, um, they gave them 5 milligrams of K1, which is a lot, the average intake is maybe 500, they gave a high amount of vitamin K1 from plants, or placebo. This K1 is not a potent vitamin K. At the meeting, they said, hey, vitamin K doesn't work. It doesn't change bone density. We did this for a couple years. It didn't do any good. Um, I forget how many years the study was. But they said it didn't change bone density. But those people who other studies show vitamin K doesn't affect bone density, but it affects bone strength. But they said, but by the way, we found there were half, one quarter of the cancers, and there were less than half the fractures. But their, their title was it doesn't work. Because it doesn't work because they were looking at bone density. But they, and now we realize the end point in these studies has to be fracture. Now that's what's important about osteoporosis. It's not really bone density. It's fracture. And those are very long-term studies. But, so now, now they're studying more about vitamin K. And the recent study with MK7 showed that increased bone density took three years. And the fracture studies, of course, are very expensive. And so you have to have a big company sponsoring the fracture studies. So the next step is the alkaline diet. People are familiar. This is the fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. This is what I explained about. There's some, actually, the body produces acids all the time. By all our energy production, we produce acids. What, what's an acid? An acid is a free hydrogen ion that's just out there ready to destroy things. We have, we have acid in our stomach. Why do we have that there? Because we want to transform the meat. We want to break down the meat. We need that. We need to break down proteins. But if you have acids in other parts of the body, it tends to break down tissue. You don't like a lot of free acid running around. And so the way that nature handles that is the kidneys excrete acids, the lungs excrete acid. We're producing acid all the time as I talk, as I eat. When we breathe out, that's carbon dioxide. That's carbonic acid. So mainly breathing, we excrete a lot of acids. The kidneys also excrete a lot of acid. We, can't, we don't accumulate acids in health. In fact, if you tell your doctor, hey, I'm working on pH balance, just say, honey, you're nuts. Because if your pH balance is off, you're going to die. But what they, what they haven't realized, what the researchers now know, the kidney researchers, who are the smartest of all doctors, i got to say, because they understand pH, the kidney controls pH, is that you can accumulate acids because of diet. 
It's called chronic low-grade metabolic acidosis. It's a very small accumulation, but it can have a big effect. Even though your pH doesn't change enough for you to die, it changes enough so you start enzymes don't function well, ATP doesn't function well, you're more vulnerable to things like candida, and you're breaking down bone and breaking down muscle to preserve that, to rescue the pH balance in the blood, which must be stable. So to keep bones from having to drain themselves or muscle, you change. Just have a diet that is high in vitamins. What do we eat? Is we eat roots, nuts, and seeds, grubs, whatever there was around. So we had the, the traditional diets, prehistoric diets. They estimate 85% were base forming. Had a lot of base, a lot of plant life in it. And if we return to that kind of diet of more fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, you'll be able. And it doesn't have to be a vegetarian diet. In fact, a, lo a lot of some people, especially people that are prone to be too thin, will say, wow, I lost a lot of weight, I stopped eating protein. It's not that we don't want protein, we just don't want excess protein. Like maybe, maybe 60, 70 grams of protein do really well. If you get into 120, like the average American may have, it may be too much. And even if you say, I like a high protein diet, then you just take enough minerals to balance it off, right? pH is an indirect measure of mineral reserve. If you said to me, how do I know if I have enough minerals? Remember we talked about how, if we can send a person to the moon, why can't we test? Well, a simple test is the pH test, looking at your first morning urine to see if it's, if it's 6.5 to 7.5. Um, that is a sign that you probably have enough minerals because minerals are attached to buffering compounds. Got it? You know more than the average medical professional in the country. Got it? And we have a, it's so important to us that we produce a pH kit. We didn't bring any, but, uh, but you can call our office. We'd be happy to show you uh, about that so that you can learn to measure your own pH. That's an evolving science. Somebody will think of a better way now, but this system we've developed with Dr. Russell Jaffe is very good, particularly if you can sleep six hours without urinating. If you can't, then you just measure your first morning urine but as whatever it is, but the best is six. So base-forming foods, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. We've got charts on the website. We've got all kinds of sample menus on the website. Doesn't have to be vegetarian. You need protein. Remember, protein is important to bone. But what, what you can switch, so how do you do the alkaline? You switch breads for root crops. So you say, I have sweet potatoes, baked potatoes, yams, I have squash. Those things alkalize where the breads don't. So you say, okay, let me switch that. You say, maybe I have flesh food just once a day, and maybe I have beans the other time of day, and kind of, you know, do, do moderate kind of protein. You look at things like are very acid-forming, like colas. Probably nobody here drinks colas anymore. That's such a direct route to diabetes that it's like scary. So you, so you, you, you look to all those kind of processed foods and you say two cups of vegetables for lunch and two for dinner. That can be a simple guide. How can I get two cups? Anybody doing that now? Very good. Yeah, yeah. You steam them up, what do you do? Yeah, that's very good. That's very close. Yes, that's a great, and, and the salads are a little, if, if you have hearty digestion, but now that we move into winter, even people with hearty digestion should have cooked vegetables. That's right, so you get two cups of vegetables for lunch and dinner. Think about switching the grains to root crops. They'll get you a long ways. So let's see what else we got here. So, and the reason of this is bone, we think bone, we think bone is important because it gives us structure. It allows me to walk around. It, allows, it keeps us from being a jellyfish, right? The skeleton. But the real important, but there's a more important function of the skeleton, and that is to provide pH balance, because with, to serve as a gigantic reservoir for alkali compounds. Because if you didn't have that, you would die very quickly. The pH must be precise. Uh, the body has to maintain a very precise pH, or you or you die. And so, it's got a big reserve of minerals that are attached to alkalizing compounds to call, just like it's got a big reserve of calcium. Blood calcium has to be very specific. It wasn't random that nature put calcium in bones. It's because you need to have that reserve. But if you, and every day you take out 500 milligrams, put it into the blood, and you hope you're putting 500 milligrams back into the bone. So it's, we, more and more we see the body has um, priorities, and the priority is survival. And if you nourish the part of the body that's a storehouse, which is bone, bone is your storehouse. If you nourish the storehouse, then you have a better chance of going through lean periods or tough periods or through the night when you don't have nutrients. 
So the body produces a lot of acids, but it must be alkaline, and the way we do it is the fruits and vegetables. Um, this is our little pH test tip. This is this is the next topic of detoxifying, uh, you know, a anti nutrients. You're all familiar. We we this is a little simple picture of them. Smoking, a big one. Smoking damages bone. The interesting thing, one of the blogs I just wrote, you can if you stop smoking, your bone will recover. So that's a very hopeful thing. And in fact, uh, if we if it isn't a blog we've written yet, where it's coming up very soon, it tells you how long you have to be smoking before you recover. Drinking. Same thing, you know, when I first wrote the book, I said, hey, alcohol is bad for bone. <sighs> then guess what? Then I started looking at the research really carefully, and people who have one or two drinks a day actually have better bone health. I'm still scratching my head because too much alcohol is toxic. It could be these phenolic compounds, but it also probably is that people just have an attitude adjustment, feel happy for a couple hours a day. I don't know. <laughs> but definitely, so moderate drinking is not a problem, but excessive drinking. This this whole thing of um of cola. It's very pernicious. Young girls who drink colas fracture more. It's a very good thing to, to, to work on correcting. And if you have that habit, work on it. Coffee again, uh, one or two cups of coffee can be God's elixir, but too much coffee definitely will damage bone. And again, we have another version of the, the famous soda pop here, which now, this is, this is like the old-fashioned little bottle. You know, now you, everybody buys a litter or something like that, which is incredible. So you got your camel. One of the things we're going to do is take a minute, take a break, go over this camel. And just, and just you might think, or you may, we're going to maybe pair off, chat with some, but what simple things could you do to reduce some of these burdens on this camel, whether it relates to nutrients or whether exercise or lack of sleep? or Digestion, again, 10 million people have poor digestion. That may come up on your camel, and you may say, I really need to try some of this uh, eating more in a peaceful place, sitting down and eating, chewing the food carefully, having hot and cooked food. Just awareness is very healing. Attention is very healing. Let's do exercises. We're almost getting to the end of this. Exercise, I love this. It says, the handle on your recliner does not qualify as an exercise <laughs> machine. And, you know, exercise, it is striking. It is striking of the importance of exercise to bone health. This is just a little chart showing this idea, change in bone mineral density on one axis and exercise on the other. And you see that people with low exercise all of their bone density, whether it's the spine or the hip or the arm, is much lower in people that don't exercise. There's really quite a direct correlation. Some of the studies, they took large 61,000 nurses. They looked at them for 12 years. This is an observational study. It's not a clinical trial, but it's pretty impressive because it's a lot of people. Postmenopausal women who walked just 30 minutes a day had a 40% reduction in hip fracture risk. So if you got up today and just walked a half an hour every day, you reduce your hip fracture risk by... And you probably have a much better chance of living to the age of hip fracture, which is, you know, the researchers said, geez, you can solve this problem. You could cut risk, you could cut hip fractures in half if, you, if everybody just died 10 years earlier. <laughs> so we got a choice there. If you want to live that 10 years longer, you want to pay attention. And so 30 minutes a day, very nice reduction. Weighted vests. Whenever I see thin women, we always suggest weighted vests because they did a little study. So they said, okay, we know, how do you build, why does exercise build bone? In fact, Jean, I don't know if we brought, oh, we didn't. Um, we, I have a DVD, an exercise DVD, and half of it is discussing how exercise works, and the other half is an exercise program. But what happens is when you impact, like when I walk like this, right, there's an impact, and that impact sends an electrical current and a message to the bone to build. So the more impact you have when you walk, that's why like hopping, we say hop 100 times a day, because hopping puts an unusual jolt, and that causes bone to grow. They, they, so they said, well, just how much do you have to walk to maintain hip bone density as you age, right? So they looked at a lot of people, and they said, gee, they, wa they wanted to see if this 10,000 steps, you've all heard about 10,000 steps, that 10,000 steps is a really good thing to do. So they said, well, 10,000 steps, allow you to maintain hip bone density. So they do the study, and they find out that if a person weighs 140, 150, whatever, they didn't need 10,000 steps. All they need is like 5,000 steps That would, because there's such an impact. But if a person weighs like under 120, they needed 18,000 steps, and it's impossible to get 18,000 steps. So what did the researchers say? Take weights, wear weights. And and long before this research, a doctor in Oregon, Christina Snow, started using weighted vests. And she, her conclusion was after five, they did this for five years with people. After five years, the improvement was significant. Exercise was as good or better than either estrogen or Fosamax for preventing bone loss. These women who wear a vest maybe a couple hours a day, certainly when you walk outside, it's a great idea. 
or when you many people they just wear you can even wear it around the house. It's very powerful if you wear if you're strong enough to wear it when you're doing exercise. They were able to halt menopausal bone loss in one study, which is hard to halt wearing a weighted vest during the exercise. So this is the weighted vest we use. It's ironware. It's made for women. It has a it has it has no weights on the breast. There are some other we we have two kinds of vests. This is one of the most popular things on our website. These vests. Um, because it's a great exercise tool. There's some other nice exercise tools that cause, like like a, a, an osteo ball you pull, and why does that work? Because impact is one thing, but the other thing is the tendons pulling on the bone. You know, you got you got the muscle and then the tendons attached to the bone, and when you pull, the tendon pulls on bone. Well, that tendon pulling on bone causes a stretching and a bending of bone, and stretching and bending of bone also sends a signal to build bone mass. So uh, as they try to figure out why does exercise work, it has partly to do with impact, partly to do with stretching and bending. So whether you say, geez, I like, I like walking. Let me do the weighted vest to give a little more oomph to that. I like hopping and jump roping. I like working with weights. Building strength, of course. We lose muscle as we age. You're going to see building strength is extremely important, and you can actually do it at any age. We're looking at vibration platforms, too, these platforms that jiggle you around. They seem to stimulate bone growth, especially for people that don't have time, don't take time to exercise or maybe are a little debilitated. I've been, I've been liking the looks of that. Um, Mayo Clinic study with women with, a, with fracture history. These are people who had already fractured their spines. They had these women just lay on the floor and lift their chest up, like the cobra in yoga, but um, Gene, we should remember next time to have a picture of this. But So you just lift the chest up, and that was able to, um, they did it like maybe 20 times a day. They eventually put little weight packs on their back, actually significant weight packs. We have people do it with a weight vest. And they were, these people had already fractured before. Simple back strengthening they exercise over years reduced incidence of new spinal fractures by two-thirds. So even if you say, oh, I already fractured, there's nothing I can do. There's lots you can do. And these particular exercises, a good physical therapist can help you building back extensor exercises. And we, if you search our blogs, uh, better if you go to betterbones.com, you'll find pictures of these exercises. Very impressive work at the Mayo Clinic from known physical therapists. They really looked at what you do with exercise. So if you do nothing special, no, I was wrong. Between 20 and 89, and 40 percent of their spinal bone mass, men will lose 30% of the bone mass, and men lose 60 and hitting harder with the muscle mass. This is enough to say, maybe I should do something. Just wait and let nature take, take its course. Exercise. On the other hand, you can all, Professor Evans, famous guy, interesting guy, you know who worked with him is Mim Nelson. She's got this book, Strong Women. Uh, what's it, Strong Women? Right, right. She's got several book she's been very and what they show is that the they showed that a 65 year old they made 65 year old people as physically fit as the 35 year old the 30 year old paid people training them with strength training and they made 95 year olds as strong as 55 year olds so there you build muscle mass if you decide to get into that avenue of strength training now a new frontier in exercises is a, is a different twist it's not lift and iron it's actually mindful exercises there's new research by uh, some yoga people, um, this doctor called Fishman, who has a website called sciatica.org, and he's found that he can enhance bone density with yoga. And he has 10 yoga postures that he has on his, his sciatica.org website. And if you just search yoga and osteoporosis, um, there is that stretching, right? That stretching. And even if you say, well, I'm doing a yoga posture like this that puts a lot of weight here, that's double weight. That's weight-bearing, double weight. So yoga seems to be really effective. Tai Chi, the Japanese and Chinese have studied a lot. Tai Chi is very effective for balance, for building strength. And I personally think the mindful exercises are very nice and certainly more appropriate as we get older because they also reduce cortisol, reduce anxiety, reduce the stress response. So things like Tai Chi, Qi Kung, yoga, where we actually have an intention of quieting our mind, being in touch with that inner peace within us, that is they're, extreme, they're finding that extremely beneficial for bone. So you have all kinds of exercises you can choose from. Just choose something. In fact, that's what we'll do at our break. Everybody's got to choose something. They got to choose. <laughs> they got to choose something in the exercise realm and vitamin D testing, if nothing else. Okay. Promote endocrine health. This is. 
this what we what we basically see that is really helpful in this step is the stress reduction is to work with the repair deficits that the the body would be in perfect health all the while except we don't repair appropriately and so we know that we need lots of nutrients we need to keep inflammation down we do that with antioxidants that's why we like all the fruits and vegetables but there are a lot of nice antioxidant supplements in fact we're producing one right now for our program because it's very important you know what great antioxidant here's one tomatoes lycopene new research shows that 30 milligrams of lycopene does a lot to halt bone breakdown and what it is is like one cup of tomato sauce so if you're the type of person that can have a little soup of tomato sauce every day that can be very very helpful lycopene is extremely helpful for bones and because of its antioxidant anti-inflammatory quality allergies and hypersensitives we try to deal with all these you try to deal with all these problems if you have pain if you have pain you have inflammation and inflammation is repair gone wrong, right? The body's trying to repair a tissue. It's digging out old old uh, tissue, but it's not successfully replacing new tissue. And this is where you need to boost the antioxidants and try to get to the cause of inflammation. Um, pharmace pharmaceutical agents, I, this is not really my role to talk about it. it. All I do say is if a person is using drug therapy, do all the nutrients too. Get your vitamin E tested. Be sure to take all the key bone building nutrients because that's your best chance of maximizing your bone health. The drug will only halt bone breakdown. It won't help you stabilize and build new bone without the nutrients. So you say, hey, I'm still going to do my exercise. I'm going to get all these 20 key nutrients. I'm going to do the alkaline diet, but I just decided that I'm going to do this drug therapy, or my doctor and I decided I should. Um, just fracture reduction, this is the way I look at it. The old studies, hormone replacement therapy and calcium reduced fracture by 20 to 34 percent. You've probably seen, you know, they don't use HRT much for bone health anymore because it was they did a study finally after four years and said, you know, it's a little too dangerous to use because it uh, number one selling drug for many many years till they studied it. Then that was a bad mistake they made because they realized, yeah, what time is it, team? Oh, 1:30. We gotta have our break. Shit, we're going on too long here. Okay. Anyway, the drug therapy, the bifosinates are stronger. They reduce by 30 to 50 percent. Raloxifen is much smaller only for the very few drugs affect the hip. So if you're thinking about the hip, just for the spine, calcitonin is quite weak. Calcium and vitamin D, 20 to 50 <laughs> percent. In other words, there's a lot of things that can work naturally. Just to say, Norway, they don't even give the osteoporosis drugs unless the person is fractured. Again, a government that socialized pays attention to who gets drugs, thinks about it. Test for be sure to test for success your bone mineral density, the bone breakdown test. If you're losing muscle, you know you're losing bone. If you're losing height, more than an inch and a half, probably you're losing bone. So that's our natural program. We have some, I'm not going to go into the case studies and stuff, but um, let's just stretch a minute and then let's do the questions. <laughs>